Dungeons & Dragons Birthright Gorgon's Alliance is a longer name than any game should ever have, but it's also a strategy RPG game launched for PCs in 1997. The game is a mix of grand strategy with semi-turn-based military tactics and first-person dungeon crawling RPG. That's quite an ambitious mix of different genres, especially for the time. As far as I know, this is the only time the Birthright setting has ever been adapted into a video game. Now, I've never played the pen and paper version of Birthright, but from what I can tell, the PC version seems to have done a good job at translating the original rules into a video game as you'll have several instances where your decisions and moves are based not just on your money, power and resources, but also on dice throws. But before I get to that, the game comes in a large cardboard box. I love the box art, which is ironic because I'm generally not a fan of the in-game art, but the cover here is so epic that it totally gets me pumped to play the game. On the back of the box, you get some cherry-picked screenshots. Maybe I just haven't played enough of the game, but I haven't had any army battles that looked as chaotic or frantic as this one. I also never saw my party take any JRPG-style cool poses while in the adventure mode, especially not every party member at the same time. Inside, we have the game with an installation booklet and the Dungeons & Dragons Birthright Manual. The manual does a good job at teaching you how to play the game, though the in-game tutorial will likely be more useful in that regard. I like how it lists every spell and its stats individually, though I was hoping it would do the same for all army units. Lastly, I kinda wish the manual were in color. But overall, it's a decent manual. It does its job, but it doesn't go the extra mile. Booting up the game, you can pick if you just want to play the RPG portions, where you build a party and go on adventuring. Or you can just take command in tactical army battles or play the full game. Moreover, you can toggle the complexity of the grand strategy portions, adding or removing gameplay elements depending on how deep you like your grand strategy games. Now, me, I like going for the full experience, which can be pretty complex for newcomers. Thankfully, there's a tutorial section which does a decent job at teaching you the ins and outs of the game. The tutorial isn't perfect, but you'll get the hang of it. Still, if you're like me, there will be times where you'll find yourself stuck or unable to perform a certain action without knowing why. Anyway, once you start the full game, you pick which kingdom you want to play, followed by who you want as a ruler. Each kingdom gives you one of two possible choices, and while it is possible for your ruler to die, whether in battle, adventuring or through assassination, you can have heirs. Though, generally speaking, it's still not a good idea to get yourself killed. Anyway, your goal in the game is to grow your kingdom either through conquest or by playing the political game, and eventually defeat the rampaging armies of the Gorgon. Something which I was never quite able to do, but hey, why split hairs? There are several ways to go about this, with military being the most obvious and direct approach. What's cool here, though, is that depending on your kingdom and region, you'll have access to different gameplay styles. Whether due to kingdom and army size, or magical abilities, money and regency. Gold and regency are your prime resources. Gold can be earned through taxes, trading and while questing. Though be warned, you'll need to earn a lot of gold coins while questing to earn a single gold bar in the overworld map. Regency is a measure of your political power and your lineage is the most direct way of earning more regency, meaning certain characters will always have the upper hand when playing the political game. Of course, as you conquer new land, you can also gain more regency. In fact, regency is an interesting one. You'll need it to construct buildings within your own territory, but it can also be used to claim buildings and guilds belonging to other players. This means that even if someone else is the ruling monarch of their kingdom, they can find their political power within their own land, 
greatly reduced if every major pressure group is owned by someone else. Conversely, the same can happen to you if monarchs start spinning their regency to claim ownership of your temples, guilds or laws. Of course, you can also willingly give up some of your political buildings or structures to other players in return for favors like money or military alliances. And what's even more interesting is that all of this is affected through dice rolls. So even if you have the political influence, money and armies to back it up, it can still backfire on you because of a bad dice roll. Call me crazy. But this is some high-level Game of Thrones political intrigue, which is all the more satisfying when you finally put down that kingdom that was being a torn on your side. Another interesting aspect is that even if you have a strong army and invade an enemy kingdom, you won't automatically gain control of a region just because you won the battle. Once again, you'll have to spend regency to gain control of the land, so having one without the other won't get you very far. Now, with that said, as much as I love the grand strategy aspect of the game, I also feel it does a terrible job at explaining some of the nitpicky rules. For example, you can only take three actions each turn and you can't invade an enemy kingdom unless you declare war on them. Makes sense, right? The issue is that you need to declare war every turn if you want to keep attacking. Or it won't even matter if your army is standing on their region. It won't count as an aggression. Not only that, but declaring war takes up one of your three actions. So this means starting a war makes you vulnerable in the long run as you may not have enough moves to pull off everything you want to do. When armies meet in battle, the game suddenly changes to a 3D perspective, in which you can control each battle squadron. Here, the game becomes a quasi-turn-based affair, in which actions will take a while to perform before you can control the same unit again. Think of it like the active time battle system in Final Fantasy, or a recharge rate in a modern MMO, except this applies to both combat and movement. Battles start with both armies having their units in reserve, and you can move them to the battlefield or back to the reserves depending on what fits you best. Meaning, you can store certain units in your reserves and save them for a key moment before sending them out to battle. Or you can send damaged units back to your reserves to ensure they won't die off. The offset here is that to win a battle, you have to either kill every enemy unit or you need to have four times as many units in the battlefield as your opponent. Meaning that if you send too many squadrons to your reserves, you might find yourself automatically losing the battle. And if there's no safe region to retreat to in the world map, your entire army is effectively forfeit. Other than that, it's a question of deciding which units you should send against who. I generally like to abuse the archer's versatility, as they can both move and attack nearly at the same time, which can net you some really cheap enemy kills at the expense of micromanagement and playing like a cheap bastard. Another cool thing about this mode is that you can send a regent or your heroes into battle and they're by far the most powerful units. Especially the high level mages which can cast fireballs against the enemy army before they can even touch you. And any magical gear you find while adventuring can also be used here. Did you happen to run into several fireball wands while exploring a dungeon? Well, lucky you, because you can now burn the enemy army alive before they have a chance to react. I only really have two issues with this mode. The first is that it's by far the simplest of all game modes in Dungeons and Dragons Birthright. And secondly, you have no way of knowing which battle units are suited for what without undergoing massive amounts of trial and error. Yes. You can see their stats while in battle, but not when buying units. So I often just mustered my army unit types blindly and hoped for the best. Finally, we get to the most uncommon and unique portion of this grand strategy game, the RPG mechanics. Now, 
These aren't your typical grand strategy or 4x strategy RPG gameplay elements, where your hero is just a military unit capable of leveling up. No, I mean your hero can actually recruit army lieutenants and go on adventures by themselves in a first-person RPG dungeon crawl mode. Which, as far as I know, no other 4X or grand strategy game has done before or since. Basically, if your advisors have any quests for you, you can assemble a party and set forth for your objective. Here, you'll play a dungeon crawler game using a Doom-like game engine. Your objective is always to either retrieve an artifact or kill someone and then retrieve an artifact. And while your quests are always confined to buildings, castles, keeps or similar locations, they tend to be large, sprawling and maze-like. Not only that, but they often have hidden buttons and passages which are easy to miss, so it's a good idea to take a slew of non-combat-centric spells, like find treasure, find item and detect evil, to see which areas you haven't been to yet or to have an idea if you're near a secret door or passageway. Moreover, Dungeons and Dragons Birthright does a really good job at incentivizing you to explore every nook and cranny not just so you can complete your quest, but also because, as I've mentioned before, any gold or mundane items you find can be converted towards gold bars for your country's treasury, while magical items can be used in battle. And if your character happens to level up, then all the better. Hell, this is the only D&D video game I know of where spells like Jump are really useful, as they can be used to reach secret locations with more treasure or take shortcuts on your way to your target. And honestly, have you ever played any Dungeons and Dragons video game where Jump was a useful skill to have? Hell, or any D&D game where Jump was a selectable spell at all? Because other than this one, I sure didn't. And if you complete your quest, you'll find items which can greatly aid your kingdom, like gear that increases your gold reserves every turn, or give you more regency, that sort of thing. Now, the issue is that while I greatly enjoy the RPG mode, it tends to be very buggy. It's easy to get stuck in places, die to inconsistent fall damage, or get stuck because the key you picked up simply isn't working. In fact, the game as a whole tends to suffer from various bugs, the worst of which being when the game decides to crash instead of saving your progress. Moreover, the control scheme for these 3D segments is unintuitive in a mid-90s kind of way. This was that period in gaming where 3D games had a ton of button inputs which often could have been easily streamed to the mouse. So for example, jump is A, crawl is Z, looking up and down is page up and page down, that sort of thing. The equipment and spell menus are also unintuitive, often taking longer than it should to equip or remove armor or send items to other party members. Also, I gotta be honest, while I really, really love Dungeons and Dragons Birthright, I just don't like this art style. The game launched during that awkward PC gaming period where games were usually a mix of 2D, 3D and pre-rendered graphics, which more often than not, I'm just not a fan of. Examples include Baldur's Gate, Fallout, Blood Omen and this game. Now don't get me wrong. I like these games, but I like them in spite of their graphical style, which was popular in the mid-90s, but I was never a fan of. Overall, I absolutely love Dungeons & Dragons Birthright Gorgon's Alliance. It's a deeply flawed, buggy game with a lot of often needlessly complex rules, but I also love how deep the grand strategy segments are, how fun the RPG quests are and how they tie into the main game. Moreover, you just gotta respect how ambitious Dungeons and Dragons Birthright is by essentially mixing three different genres and being mostly successful at it. Yes, 
it's not perfect, but it's a unique gem of a game and I honestly can't think of any other title that plays quite like this one. It's an acquired taste to be sure, but once you acquire it, it's hard to let go. Hey everyone, thank you for watching Stika's Retro Corner. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe and share this video. All that fun social media stuff. And be sure to hit that notification bell icon to know when a new video is out. Anyway, I hope you have a great day. Bye!